So tonight's presentation will be me going first for about 35 minutes or so, I hope. And then we're going to have two uh, Yenjing scholars who will join to present about their motivation for applying to the program, their experience here at YCA, uh, the courses they took and their thesis topic in the law and society concentration. And then at the end, we'll have some uh, time for answering the questions that have been typed into the Q&A function. So with that having been said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so Peking University was founded in 1898, making it the oldest uh, institution of higher education uh, in China's modern education system. It was founded as part of a reform movement in the, right at the beginning of the last decade of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the Hundred Days of Reform. And although this reform movement, which was led by the second to last emperor of the Qing dynasty, the Guangxu Emperor, would eventually fail, one of the lasting institutional legacies of the Hundred Days of Reform was the founding of the Jingzhi Da Xuetang, the Imperial University of Peking, which uh, you know was the original name for Beida or Peking University. On the right here, you can see the famous Western Gate to PKU's campus. It's a, a lovely uh, gate and inside some more lovely buildings that calls to mind um, palatial Chinese architecture. That would make sense because uh, a portion of today's Peking University campus was originally built as a summer as part of a summer palace complex for the Qing Dynasty's royal house. So PKU is not only just a lovely place, but it's also incredibly historically and cultural significant significant. So it's really a nice place to live, to work and to study. Here's some of the other you know, lovely shots of our, our campus. Um, for those of you who aren't in Beijing right now, it is cold and rainy right now and perhaps going to start lightly snowing at some point later tonight. I would like to point out that uh, the center photo um, is Jingyuan. It's a grassy area in the central western portion of PKU's campus. Jingyuan is really the center of uh, academic and administrative life at the Yanjing Academy. It's also in and of itself historically significant because this, these buildings, uh, originally built in the 1920s, were the original campus of another university, Yanjing University. Yanjing University was uh, an American-run uh, liberal arts university that was active from 1916 to 1952. In 1952, Yanjing University closed down and Peking University moved from its original campus, which was a little closer to the center of the city, out to today's PKU campus. So we've chosen the name Yanjing Academy of Peking University to call to mind those two important traditions of educational excellence. Yanjing University, which was bringing the best practices of liberal arts education and introducing them to the nascent Chinese modern education system in the first decades of the 20th century. And of course, the stellar legacy of Peking University. PKU today has over 8,200 faculty members organized in 49 schools and departments. And those faculty members mentor over 43,000 full-time Chinese students and just under 2,800 international students um, every year. So we are very fortunate, Yanjing Academy, to have the full support of the resources, the administration, the faculty, and the staff of Peking University. So Yanjing Academy is a fully funded two-year master's program in China studies. And what we're doing here is creating a center for um, top scholars from around the world, uh, including China, to learn deeply about uh, China, the changes that it has gone through in recent decades, and how the results of those changes are changing China's role in the world. Having run the admissions process at Yanjing Academy for uh, over a year now, and having gotten to know current and former Yanjing scholars, I can fully attest to the fact that we are a magnet from outstanding young scholars from all around the world. We're also engaged in a, a really fascinating and important experiment in bringing the best practices of interdisciplinary education and training in interdisciplinary research methodologies to the Chinese higher education system. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that coming up. And then this final bullet point, uh, a catalyst for international dialogue. Now, although this sounds like perhaps the most talking pointy of the talking points on this slide, it is actually quite true. 
When you have shared interests in China with uh, brilliant young people from all over the world, you're reading some of the same books, taking classes together, uh, the debates and discussions you have in class, the discussions you have in the dormitory, uh, on campus, in the cafeteria, what have you, really will open your eyes to a diversity of opinions and will lead to what we're calling here a kind of international dialogue. So we are a full fellowship residential college program. And what we mean by that is in the first year, all Yenjing scholars are required to live on campus in the Yenjing Academy House, a dormitory specifically for Yenjing scholars. Um, international scholars, although we encourage them, strongly encourage them to spend their second year in Beijing to get a better sense of um, the next, the incoming cohort of Yenjing scholars to have a greater, deeper experience with Peking University and to get to know the wonderful city of Beijing a little bit better in their second year. International scholars are not required to be in China for their second year, although they're encouraged to do so. Scholars from mainland China and from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, however, are required to be in Beijing for both years of the Yejing Academy Master's Program. The language of administration and instruction at Yejing Academy is English. So no Chinese language proficiency is required for admission to the program. That having been said, we are a China studies graduate program. And so we welcome applications from uh, potential Yenjing scholars who have previous training in China studies, uh, you know, certain levels of proficiency or fluency in the Chinese language. Now we have designed our curriculum to encourage and in some ways to push Yenjing scholars outside of the courses that we offer here into the broader Peking University academic community. The core required courses that I'll cover in, in, in a couple of slides from now only uh, account for about 40, 45% of the total academic credits needed in your first year of classes at Yenjing Academy, leaving uh, ample opportunity for our scholars to join other courses in other departments and schools at the university. Most of those that most of the courses that our scholars will choose will be in English, and there are plenty of them on campus. But if scholars are fluent in Chinese, uh, we strongly encourage them to take content courses in other departments and schools taught in Chinese. So let's talk money and funding. In the United States, my, my home country, if you couldn't tell from my accent, uh, it is very, very difficult to find a fully funded master's program. At Yanjing Academy, we take care of all of your financial needs for the time that you are studying with us. The Yanjing Fellowship includes tuition payment. It includes accommodation in the first year. That's uh, free accommodation in the Yanjing Academy dormitory. Uh, in the second year, if a scholar chooses to live off campus in Beijing, we pay a uh, housing stipend for that scholar which is sufficient for you to rent a room in a shared apartment in Beijing, but probably not enough to rent a full apartment to yourself. The fellowship also includes a monthly stipend for living expenses of 3,000 renminbi a month, which is going to be about 550 US dollars a month. In the first year, we offer a, a round-trip travel stipend to and from your home city. And we also offer basic medical insurance. And this is medical insurance specifically designed for international students studying in China. So this is a major investment that we're making in each individual Yanjing scholar, roughly about 120 scholars per year. And so at the end of the first year, we conduct an academic review. Uh, this academic review uh, assesses the academic performance of first-year Yanjing scholars according to some basic regulations and basic standards that are clearly laid out in orientation and in our academic handbook. These standards include completing 31 academic credits in your first year, not failing any core courses, and maintaining a certain minimum GPA. At the end of the first year, uh, Yanjing scholars apply for their second year fellowship and as long as you meet those standards that are laid out in the academic handbook, you will receive the fellowship for your second year. Now, I mentioned that some international scholars might choose to not be based in Beijing or even in China for their second year. Again, we strongly encourage all Yanjing scholars to be based in Beijing for their second year. But internship opportunities, uh, research requirements, or sometimes just life 
uh, requires that you maybe not be based in Beijing. If that is the case, then you can still receive a partial uh, second year Yanjing Fellowship, which will cover your tuition and will cover your living expenses. Now, the medical insurance and the housing stipend will not be paid to scholars who are not based in Beijing for their second year. Additionally, we have other funding opportunities for second year Yanjing scholars. These are offered on a competitive application basis, and they include teaching assistantships, research assistantships, residential assistantships, and working in some of our administrative offices. This is a way for second year Yanjing scholars to contribute to the program in a different way and to have some extra funding support. Okay, um, this is an important slide here, and uh, we're gonna talk about this for a little bit and then go back to it later in my presentation. What you see here are the six research concentrations at the Yanjing Academy. Now, although we are an interdisciplinary program, once you're in, you are allowed to, with con in the consultation with your advisor, to pick and choose elective courses that are interesting to you and help you prepare for your second year master's thesis research project. Those courses can be from any discipline in the humanities and social sciences. Aside from that, these six research areas are quite important to your academy in three ways. The first way is the application. In your application, you will choose one of these six research areas uh, in which to conduct your studies and your master's thesis. So when you apply, you choose one of these. The second way that the research areas are important is how your thesis is uh, evaluated at Peking University. So the process is as follows. Your thesis advisor must approve the final draft of your thesis and, and confirm that it is ready for submission for a defense. You then have an oral defense of your thesis uh, with multiple faculty members asking questions and engaging in discussion with you about the findings of your thesis paper. And finally, the last step before you can consider yourself graduated is your thesis must be reviewed by two other faculty members at Peking University from the law school or from the sociology department, at least from a field that is adjacent to the topic of your thesis paper. Only when these two faculty reviewers have determined that your thesis meets the standards of master's degree programs at Peking University and makes a contribution to the field appropriate to the level of a master's student, will your thesis be complete and you can consider yourself having graduated. And then finally, when you graduate, this research area will be on your master's diploma. So it will say, Peking University, Master of Law, China Studies, Law and Society, or Peking University, Master of History, China Studies, History and Archaeology. So these are the three ways that these research areas are important to your time at Yanjing Academy. We'll talk a little bit more about this coming up, uh, specifically in your strategies for applying to the program and how your previous academic training and or professional experience should help prove that you were prepared for um, master's level research in the research area that you have chosen to apply to. Okay, um, these are the core courses that all first year Yanjing scholars uh, must complete in their first year. And again, I said this is about 40 or 45 percent of your total academic credits required in year one. China in Transition 1 and 2 is a two semester interdisciplinary look at contemporary China. The first semester is structured according to large lectures by PKU faculty members, sometimes discussions or debates as well. These are large lectures, discussions, or debates that all Yanjing scholars attend. Immediately following the large lecture session, you have breakout discussion sections led by a TA of about 15 to 20 uh, Yanjing scholars. In the discussion section, you discuss the readings that were assigned for that week, the content of the lectures, the content of the Q&A after the lectures, etc. The second semester of China in Transition, this is the spring of your first year, narrows the admittedly broader focus of China in Transition 1 into a field research course. 
So you will choose one of multiple China in Transition Part 2 field research courses led by a Peking University faculty member, one that suits your interest and perhaps will hopefully prepare you for your second year master's thesis research project. Then you will um, join the course. The faculty member will help guide you step by step through the process of um, conceptualizing, um, conducting, analyzing, and writing up your field research. It also has the added benefit of making sure that you already will have one full on the ground field research experience research in year two. Field study is a course that all Yanjing scholars take in their first year. It is a pretty intense academic excursion, which takes the scholars and most of the faculty and most of the staff at the Yanjing Academy outside of Beijing to another city around China. For the first four years, we took students to Xi'an, a metropolis in the northwestern province of Shanxi. And this last year, we took students to Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province in southwestern China. So this is a, you know, a travel experience, but it is also an intense academic experience. You will have guest lectures from local experts. You'll meet with uh, professors and graduate students at local universities. You'll do site visits of uh, cultural, historical, or archaeological sites. You'll also go do um, site visits and interviews at um, leading industries, business parks, tech companies that are representative of the area's local economy. The goal of this course is to not only take your learning outside of the classroom, but also to take your learning experience outside of Beijing itself. Topics in China Studies Lecture Series is a year-long course that brings in um, leading figures in multiple fields or professions loosely connected to China Studies. They come in and give an hour and a half long lecture, hang out at the, the academy, has, you have a chance to meet them and chat with them, takes questions from the students, and then um, this course will culminate in a series of short reaction papers or a longer paper responding to some of the lectures. So uh, last year, we had the former chairman and CEO of China Mobile Corporation talk about China's uh, development through 2G, 3G, and 4G, and how the, how the rollout of 5G is already changing the Chinese market and perhaps the world. We also had um, University of Chicago ancient history professor talk about using network analysis to uh, revisit and give a new, a deeper and different understanding of the warring states period in ancient China, which led to the first unification of China under the Qin dynasty in 221 BCE. And we also had world famous contemporary Chinese artist Xu Bing talk about his theory and practice of creating a uh, contemporary art that is both distinctively Chinese, but also universally legible. Really, really fascinating series of lectures. Finally, academic writing. This is a series of seminars and discussions and lectures by different faculty members at Peking University uh, who come in and talk to you about the entire process from start to finish of conducting your master's thesis research. Conceptualizing a project, identifying important bodies of secondary literature, finding a, a space to make a contribution, conducting your research, analyzing your data, whatever it may be, drafting your paper, etc. This course culminates in a, the formal submission at the end of your first year of your master's thesis research proposal. Now, all international scholars are required to take Chinese language courses. There will be four hours of language classes per week with two additional hours one-on-one -on -one with a language tutor who is a graduate student in the School of Teaching Chinese as a Second Language at Peking University. Now, if a scholar, an international scholar, is already at a very advanced level of Chinese language proficiency, as indicated by having successfully completed the HSK level six, then they can place out of the Chinese language courses, but are still required to fill the same academic credits, if you have an HSK level six test and you passed it, then you are still required to um, take those academic credits and we will encourage you to take at least one course per semester taught in academic uh, requirements. 
So here you can see some of the shots of what our students are doing on the fall field study. Background, you see uh, students in Xi'an a couple of years ago learning the Chinese art of shadow puppetry. In the foreground, you see a young Yanjing scholar practicing Sichuan opera at a tea house in Chengdu. So this is sort of the fun side of the uh, uh, fall field research trip. You know, if you're in Xi'an, you're going to go see the terracotta soldiers. If you're in Chengdu, you're going to go see the pandas. But as I tried to stress before, it's not just a fun touristy excursion. The second semester of China in Transition, this is the field research semester, um, is where you narrow down your focus and under the guidance of a PKU professor, conduct field research. Here you can see um, where, some of our, where some of our groups and the previous three years went to conduct their field research. For instance, in 2019, we had 30 different groups of students visit 15 provinces, cities, or regions around China. I want to emphasize that these, this field research activity in China in Transition 2 is funded by the Yanjing Academy. Similarly, we also have a first year independent research funding grant called the Dean's Research Grant. And this is uh, scholars either individually or in small groups write a formal research proposal. Um, if approved on the basis of making a contribution and being a practical research project, you will then be funded for another independent research project in the first year. So here you can see on this slide um, some courses that Yenjing scholars have taken in the broadly defined field of law and society. On the left, these are courses that are offered by the Yenjing Academy itself. Contemporary Chinese society, Chinese population, Chinese frontier societies, the legal dynamics of Chinese commerce and society, et cetera. On the right, you see a selection of elective courses that Yanjing scholars in the law and society focus, or not necessarily, they could be from another research area. But here are some of the courses that Yanjing scholars have chosen to take as an elective in other administrative law, historical sociology, Chinese foreign investment law, et cetera. I would like to stress that these courses are um, perhaps not available every semester. Just like any university, it depends on which professor is teaching what course on any given semester. So you'll need to, if accepted, go to the online uh, class registration portal, here at Yanjing Academy. But I just wanted to give you uh, some ideas of the ways that uh, Yanjing scholars uh, fill their elective course credit requirements. And here we have um, a you know, small selection of the thesis topics that some Yanjing scholars have done within the law and society concentration. So companionship 2.0, uh, the domestication of social companion robots in East Asia, cool. Family policies and their effects in Germany, experience for China, comparative study of language reforms in China's Xinjiang, Turkey, and Kazakhstan. So always some interesting projects that our scholars uh, have decided to work on and eventually completed in the process of their second year of research and writing at Yanjing Academy of Peking University. You know, we are certainly an academic program. Uh, but that's not the only thing that we try to uh, help cultivate in our scholars. Through our colleagues at the Student Affairs Office at Yanjing Academy, we also have voluntary extracurricular events and activities that focus on career development and training. You know, it seems like almost every week we have a career-related um, evening event. Uh, we very frequently have uh, major corporations, consultancies, international organizations come to the Yanjing Academy for recruiting events to recruit our scholars to apply for internships or for employment after they graduate. Here you can see one of the vice presidents of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, talking with interested Yanjing scholars. Now in your first year, Yanjing scholars cannot uh, have an internship. You're going to be too busy with coursework, trusts, and other activities. But in the summer after your first year and in your second year, we encourage and support Yanjing scholars uh, in their quest to find uh, that next internship that'll hopefully help them um, you know, find uh, their dream job after they graduate. So here you can see some of the Chinese corporations that are going global, 
multinational corporations in China, consultancies, and international organizations where Yanjing scholars have had successful internship experiences. Um, generally, Yanjing scholars are able to find their own research, or pardon me, their own internship opportunity through LinkedIn searches or through networking events in Beijing. But if a scholar is having a problem finding a, um, an internship opportunity that suits their needs, then we'll be happy to use our institutional connections uh, to try to help you get your foot in the door. Yanjing scholars have had great success in finding productive ways of taking that next step in their career after graduation. About 30% of Yanjing scholars uh, go on to further graduate programs like a law school, medical school, or um, further graduate study at the doctoral level. On the left, you can see some of the top universities worldwide where Yanjing scholars have gone on for further graduate study. And on the right, you can see some of the you know, corporations, uh, consultancies, international organizations where our scholars have found employment upon graduation. Here you're looking at the themes and sort of uh, posters of our flagship extracurricular event, the Yanjing Global Symposium. The Yanjing Global Symposium is an international China studies conference uh, that is conceptualized, organized, and administered by Yanjing scholars themselves. Of course, uh, our student affairs office offers the necessary administrative support, but this is a student-run global China studies conference. You can see some of the themes that our scholars have uh, thought up. They, they define the theme, they put out a call for papers and delegates, they review thousands of applications, and the Yanjing Academy flies in all of the delegates and keynote speakers for a long weekend of paper presentations, symposia, uh, keynote lectures, uh, networking, et cetera. It's a truly excellent event. Unfortunately, we had to cancel the 2020 Yanjing Global Symposium. This takes place in late March, early April of every year. And I think you all remember uh, what the status of international travel was in March of 2020. Never fear, uh, the 2021 Yanjing Global Symposium is already being organized. I expect our student leaders will be putting out a call for papers soon. Uh, whether this will take place online, uh, offline in Beijing, or a combination of the two is uh, too early to say. So some demographic data on um, the six cohorts of Yanjing scholars that we've had since 2015. We've had over 650 scholars from just under 80 countries and regions, about 40% from Asia, about a quarter from North America, just under a quarter from Europe, and 12% um, from Latin America, Africa, and Oceania. Obviously, we look forward to hopefully increasing our enrollments from some of the regions that are um, that are not yet as represented as we'd like them to be. But that just depends on applicants that we get every year. And it's also dependent upon Yanjing Academy continuing to build partnerships with institu institutions of higher education in those regions. If not for 2020, I would have already gone to probably 13 or 14 different countries uh, around the world to strengthen or build those kinds of institutional relationships. So we have had scholars from just under 300 universities worldwide join uh, the Yanjing Academy over the first six years of our operation. Here are some of the top universities around the world that have put multiple uh, graduates into our program. So um, this is a, a very, very small selection of the nearly 300 universities. But um, as I said, we are bringing in uh, incredibly bright, incredibly talented young scholars from all over the world. You know, most Yanjing scholars uh, have a bachelor's degree, although every year we do have a significant number who already have a previous master's degree or perhaps a law degree. You can see on the left the number of bachelor degree holders and on the right the number of master's degree holders um, joining us in the first six cohorts at Yanjing Academy. So it is still significantly more um, bachelor's degree holders but we also welcome applications from uh, scholars who already have uh, a master's degree. Now we do also have a significant number of scholars who have completed their bachelor's degree 
then go on to work for a couple of years. The average age of the Nanjing scholars is, I want to say, 24 or so. Um, we have never accepted a scholar over 28 years old. Uh, this is not a hard and fast regulation, but uh, that is just what has happened historically. Part of the reason for that is uh, the only route for mainland Chinese scholars to join the program is through the recommendation system to avoid the uh, National Graduate Entrance Examination coming out of a Chinese mainland Chinese university. And those scholars join us immediately after graduation, around 22 years old. So we do try to keep uh, a, a fairly tight age range um, for all Yanjing scholars in the hopes of building a stronger sense of community in the short time that they are here together with us in Beijing. Okay, now you can see some data on the research concentrations that Yanjing scholars have chosen over the first six years of the program. The most popular research areas for Yanjing scholars, law and society, what we'll be focusing on today, um, is second most popular at 15 want to have in any given research area. What you're seeing here, this fairly imbalanced breakdown of research concentrations at YCA, is simply um, the a reflection of what the most competitive applicants in that year were interested in studying with us here at Genjing Academy. So you are free, and we encourage you to uh, study what you're interested in. Believe me, I've gone through a master's program, I've gone through a PhD program. If you aren't you know, passionate about your, your research topic, um, that simply adds another challenge and an already challenging process of graduate study. Um, so one thing that I think we should discuss a little bit here is about application strategies. Um, so we are a highly competitive graduate program funded graduate program in China studies. And so um, we will be evaluating all applicants. Um, one of the ways that we evaluate application packages is assessing uh, whether or not a, an applicant's previous academic training, either undergrad and or master's degree, and perhaps his or her internship or professional experience, whether that experience put together um, has created a sufficient academic foundation uh, that can ensure to the highest possible degree success conducting research at the graduate level in the research area you have chosen. So I am not saying at all, I am not saying that you should only apply to the research area that you majored in in your previous academic experience. What I am saying is that you should have um, training and experience in that area in order to be successful, not only applying to the Engineering Academy, but also in uh, conducting your research and be having your master's thesis be approved by uh, the faculty reviewers at Peking University. So what does that mean? Um, let's say, I assume you're all focusing on law and society or interested in law and society, great, whether it's a legal study, whether it's sociology or a combination of the two. Um, Let's say you started your, you focus in your undergrad, you majored in um, East Asian languages and literatures. So you have some Chinese language background, but you were, um, you know, if you had a graduating thesis in undergrad, it was on the writings of Lu Xun. So East Asian languages and literature going into law and society isn't necessarily a clear transition. It might be something that our admissions office would say, huh, okay, we noticed that this applicant, um, doesn't obviously have any training in sociology or legal studies. So then we'll go through your academic transcript and see and ask you, has this person uh, taken courses in sociology or pre-law? Or does this applicant perhaps have some internship experience that might you know, increase their level of preparation um, for the law and society research track here at Yanjing Academy? So again, you do not it's, you are not restricted to only applying to what you've already studied. But if you think perhaps that your previous academic experience and or work experience won't easily represent your um, potential and your training in the research area to which you are applying, well then anticipate that we'll have those questions and try to make sure that they're addressed in your personal statement 
or your research, or your statement of research interest, or perhaps on your CV. Um, so just a little bit of advice for the application process. So what are we looking for in a prospective Yanjing scholar? Um, well, as I said, we are a highly competitive program. So, you know, and we're an academic research focused program. So we want someone who has an outstanding academic record. Um, but that's not all we're looking for. Let's say you spend a lot of time and effort and energy in extracurricular activities. Um, if you think the extracurricular activities are, um, have given you specific experience or skills or perspective that can enrich our student and our academic community here, tell us about it. We want to know. We value that too. Are you an athlete? Uh, were you in student government? Are you an artist, a musician? Do you have a startup company? Um, did you spend significant amount of time in community service, uh, in charity? These are things that we are interested in knowing about, especially if you think that they have shaped who you are as a young person and as a young scholar. You know, we are a truly multicultural academic community. People from different cultures, different language backgrounds, different countries, different continents. And so this brings a lot of rewarding opportunities for cross-cultural dialogue and understanding, but also some challenges. So we value applicants who have a multicultural experience or interest in multicultural communication and experience. We are a China studies program. So we want scholars who are interested in studying China in China. Now you do not have to be a fully fledged soon to be China academic. You do not have to have majored in, you know, Chinese language with a minor in Chinese literature in order to be accepted into the program. We do, however, value those students. So if you have been focused on Asian studies or Chinese studies, you know, if you've studied abroad in China, wonderful, you know, please emphasize that in your application. But we also every year have a lot of incredibly valuable um, young Yanjing scholars joining our program who haven't yet started their journey into the study of China. Perhaps you have just been, um, you've excelled in another field, um, biotech or AI or, um, you know, other languages or economics or, you know, sociology. Perhaps you have a law degree. And now at this point in your career, you've realized that in order to set yourself up for a better future, you need to know more about China. Uh, that this is a gap in your knowledge that you are passionate about and driven to fill. And so you might be making a sort of lateral movement from an area that you've already excelled in, and you want to take the knowledge and experience that you've had in that area, whether it's academic or professional, and apply it to China. Um, that is also a kind of applicant that we are looking for. We are not a one-size-fits-all program, and there is not a single type of applicant that we're looking for. Um, you know, just like any university application, any grad school application, internship, or job application, you need to tell us why you're interested in coming here. You know, why do you want to study China in China? What attracts you to the program? Um, and why do you want to come to study with us at this point in your career? We also want to know what are your career goals? You know, what's your next step after Yanjing? Or where do you where do you see yourself in 10 years or 20 years? What are your career plans and how can two years of intensive study of China in China and a, a diploma, a master's degree from Peking University help you achieve those goals? Now, if you are not a native speaker of English, we need a, a demonstration of English language proficiency. So what does that mean? Um, well, if you are a non-native English speaker, but you attended an undergraduate program or a graduate program where the only language of instruction was English, then you, the, we take that as a sign that you are already uh, fluent enough in English to uh, conduct academic research and attend courses in it. If not, then we will need one of the standard um, English language proficiency tests. I'll tell you a little bit more about that coming up. Okay. Um, so there are some, there are multiple academic, or pardon me, there are multiple application regimes for different scholars based on where they're from. Um, if you are a citizen of the PRC, a mainland Chinese scholar, uh, unfortunately, the only way to apply and be admitted into the program 
is if you have attended a mainland Chinese university and your department or your school at that university has granted you zuga, this is a recommendation for um, skipping the national graduate entrance examination. Unfortunately, that is the currently the only route for admission for scholars from mainland China. We have some um, proposals in that are under review to um, open up another route of admission for uh, PRC citizens, perhaps who've studied abroad, but that has not yet been reviewed uh, and uh, whether it will be approved, we don't know yet. So for mainland Chinese scholars, you must apply through the Tuimian system at your mainland Chinese university. If you are a scholar from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, you will still apply based on the next um, slide that I'll show you, the standard Yanjing Academy application process. But there is also an additional application process for uh, scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. This is uh, the Peking University Admissions Portal or application portal specifically for Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. Uh, this is something that you must complete by the application deadline of December 4th, 2020. Since this is a university level application requirement, if you do not complete that Peking University uh, application for scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, then we will be unable to review your application materials. So don't skip that. Please go to our website and we have detailed information about that application process for um, scholars from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. The basic the most basic uh, condition that you must meet to be considered for admission is completing a bachelor's degree by the end of August 2021. So we, you know, we welcome applications from uh, students in their final year of university. That's pretty standard, but you must complete your bachelor's degree before the end of August. We are a graduate program after all, so you have to be a graduate student. Okay, the deadline. December 4th, 2020, 12 o'clock p.m. Beijing time. This is very, very important. Make sure you know the time difference from your region to where and, and Beijing, because our standards are set to Beijing time. And so um, at, you know, if you apply at 1 p.m. Beijing time on December 4th, you're too late. Your application is late. So please apply online at yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. If a certificate of English proficiency is required, we need IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge, etc. We will need to see diplomas from all previous institutions of higher education from which you have graduated. Or if you are currently enrolled and not yet uh, a graduate of the program, that's fine. But we will need the standard form from your, maybe it's your university registrar that says you are a currently enrolled student on track to graduate no later than August 31st, 2021. We need a personal statement um, of no more than 750 words in English. Everything is in English in this application. This personal statement should introduce who you are, um, why you're interested in Yanjing Academy, why you are interested in China studies, what your career goals are, how we can help you achieve those goals, and, and what you can bring specifically uh, to contribute to our student community. This year, we have a new requirement. That is the research proposal, maximum of one page. This research proposal should be sort of your academic self-introduction to us. Um, you know, what problems are you interested in trying to solve while, while you're here? What questions are you interested in trying to answer as part of your potential master's thesis research project? Now, we wanna let you know that this research proposal does not have to be what you actually end up writing your master's thesis on. But we wanna see how you conceptualize the topic that you're interested in researching. We wanna know how you write about the topic that you're interested in researching. You know, it can be a very formal academic proposal, uh, but it needs to be one that is going to, you know, be within the standards of the humanities and social sciences. And also, you should think about this as perhaps the first official statement in what will be a two plus year long discussion about your maturation into a master's degree researcher in China studies. We wanna see your resume or CV, and we need two letters of recommendation. 
These letters of recommendation must be academic references, and they must be from associate professors or full professors or their equivalent. We know that not every university system in the world operates on that assistant associate full professor level. We understand that. We have we understand the um, the equivalent positions, but they must be from associate or full professor. This is Peking University standard, and this is the sort of standard requirement for all top graduate programs in China. If you have some uh, other other recommenders that you'd like to write a supporting letter for you, we're happy to see those. If it's someone from an internship experience or professional manager, that's great. Uh, they just cannot replace the two academic uh, letters of reference. They can be submitted as additional documents. Okay, that is about all I have for you. On this last slide here, I'd like to give you a couple bits of advice. First, go to our website. Definitely go to our website. Look over the details of the admissions process. Look over the details of our curriculum, the professors, the faculty who teach here. And especially look at the profiles of current and former Yanjing scholars. I hope it'll be inspiring to you, but I hope it'll also drive home the point that um, not only are we diverse, you know, nationally, linguistically, culturally, but we also have, uh, we always accept students with diverse backgrounds, some from undergrad who are China studies, some with master's program who aren't China studies, some who've worked for a few years, all of them, you know, you can see that you can really um, find a, a, it doesn't take one type of academic training to get into the program. I hope you check out those um, profiles and learn about how some other people got into the program, what they're doing here, and where they want to go after it. Um, also, if you have questions that you can't find answers to on the website or in the Q&A session coming up, please feel free to contact us at yca-admissions pku.edu.cn. If you're using WeChat, please scan the QR code on the right of the screen. Uh, uh, follow our official WeChat account. Um, keep up to date with what's going on here at Peking University and at the Yanjing Academy. So thank you all very much for your uh, attention. Without further ado, let's hear from Lucas. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you, Professor Haas, for inviting me and Angela for your amazing presentation. I'm so glad to hear that you are doing an amazing uh, thing now. You are at the Yale Law School, that's amazing. I'm not as interesting as Angela, but I'll try my best to keep you entertained for the next 10 or 15 minutes and give you some tips on how to apply to Yen uh, uh, So I'm, I'm 2019, I'm a Yen scholar. I'm from Brazil, where I'm currently am. I'm in Sao Paulo here. Uh, I'm a bachelor, I'm, I, did, I did my Bachelor of Laws here in Brazil at FGV, which is a high institution education and research institution in Brazil and a leading think tank in Latin America. So it's not a university per se, but it's, uh, it's uh, a, found a presidential foundation that does research and uh, education, in, uh, uh, higher education. So that's my background. Uh, doing undergrad, I studied abroad in the US, South Africa and the Netherlands um, in different uh, opportunities. So summer schools in human rights in South Africa to study urbanization and law, and in the US, I did an exchange program at Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, and over there, I engaged with uh, interdisciplinary research and uh, learning opportunities, such as uh, learning about law and finance and neuroscience and, uh, and uh, legal ethics. So uh, very interesting uh, kind of undergrad experiences uh, without a clear focus. Uh, and I also founded and worked and worked in student-led initiatives and minored in international relations. And I founded and, and worked in many uh, the, of, of these uh, initiatives, such as um, a free prep course for students to join my university. So uh, during Saturdays, I was there working for uh, trying to enhance their opportunities to uh, enter a prestigious higher education uh, institution in Brazil, which is kind of competitive. Uh, so, um, if you have this kind of background, you know, you if you, uh, you you have to be encouraged to apply. As you can see, I didn't have I didn't have uh, a clear 
China background during my undergrad. And what did, uh, so I worked in, at, at investment banking, Itaubibia, which is the largest uh, investment bank in Latin America. And then I changed completely to politics and civil service. So I, I was an intern at, the, at Sao Paulo Municipal Council. And then I, I worked in the Sao Paulo state government with the Secretary of Education and the Foreign Minister of Education in Brazil. So you can imagine the huge challenges we had. Uh, and we were basically taking care of 3 million, to 3 million students in the state of Sao Paulo that were in our network in the public connect. So it, my experience is very diverse and not, not, not China focused. During Yanqing, I was a Thinking China Associate in Beijing. Thinking China is, is this program sponsored by the University of Turin in, in, from Italy, and they do an amazing job of connecting uh, international and Chinese students in Beijing with Chinese professors. So it's an out campus activity, outside campus activity, but Thinking China is uh, is a partner of Peking University. I also co-founded with uh, former Yanqing uh, scholars and current Yanqing scholars, uh, Observa China, which happens to be one of the first uh, Portuguese-speaking uh, China watching networks. So we are kind of uh, young China watchers for Portuguese-speaking uh, young people. So basically that's what we have been doing. Um, and I'm also a host of Pagode Chinese, which is the first Portuguese podcast on China, too. And uh, it's, 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 it's a blast. I, I love doing this. So, yeah, and I'm also a teaching assistant at Yin Chin. So that's what I'm doing right now. And my plans, so I, I plan to return to China. I don't know when and how, but I, I will definitely somehow go back to China because I'm passionate about this country and my experience at Yin Chin was uh, essential for to build this interest in myself. So I will return to China to try to learn Chinese and work and experience different cities and settings. So Yanqing and Peking University are amazing for you to start your China experience, but you can definitely uh, try to do something else after your graduate, move to another Chinese city and try different kind of, kinds of projects around China. And I plan to further pursue education, uh, PhD, LLM, or SJD, while continuing my project, my project here in Brazil. So that are, these are my plans. Uh, my thesis, that's the, that's the title of it, the tentative title, One Country, Two Systems, Three Legal Orders, The Rule of Law and Language of Macau, uh, on the Chinese Greater Bay Area Plan. So uh, basically, I'm trying to understand how this economic political integration plan uh, is dealing with Macau's language and law as a colonial legacy. So basically, you know, Macau used to be a Portuguese colony, such as, as Brazil was. So I'm trying to find this, uh, how to navigate through these legacies and how the Chinese central government is trying to use, you know, Portuguese law and language to diversify the economy of Macau. So basically, this is a research dealing with uh, an economic plan, a uh, very sensitive political landscape, and a semi-colonial or colonial experience of the Portuguese empire in Asia. So I'm trying to connect these things in order to unravel how, the, how does this plan articulate uh, all of this information into a very uh, specific way of developing a region. So th that's, that's my, my, my research. And how and why I came to this research proposal, it's a, you know, a mix and match of all my interests. So my research interests have, have always been Law and development, which is a trend, uh, it's a, a scholarly trend in my home university. Uh, economic law, uh, critical legal studies, comparative law, and Sino-Brazilian relations in general. So, uh, more than that, uh, I also did this classes. I took these classes at Yanqing, and they helped me to, you know, build the foundations to come to this uh, thesis proposal. So. These are the classes I took at the Yanqing. Um, and I also have other interests. And that's important to say to you, but you are integral, right? Like you have to present yourself fully in this process. So tell, tell Yanqing about your, yourself 
as a whole, you know? So I'm also interested in the history of ideas, modern Chinese history, Brazilian sociology, the history of Portuguese empire and literature, but also, you know, Star Wars, K-pop, Samba, and Bossa Nova. So uh, you, you have to, you know, put yourself into this uh, fully, you know, because people will meet you in the dormitories. They want to talk to you about your interests. So be an interesting person, um, go beyond your uh, research interests, and maybe this can help you shape a very intriguing and nice uh, thesis. I hope my thesis will be a nice and intriguing and uh, an, uh, an important uh, contribution to academia as well. My motivation to apply for YCA. So it's a diverse and tailor-made curriculum as Professor Haas told you. Uh, also, it, the, the academy is fully integrated with Peking University, which is kind of unique and very interesting to, to see happening in practice. And Peking University is a leading institution shaping Chinese modern history, scientific progress, economic development, and governance. So if you want to understand China from an academic standpoint, try to be in at Beida. It's the, best, it's the single best place to be in China in order to unravel how scientific progress, economic development, and modern history relates in this amazing and developing country that China is ever, ever, ever transitioning. So it's very interesting to be at Peking University witnessing this phenomenon. So uh, it's also amazing and collaborative network of fellow scholars from all over the world. You know, we are always helping each other. I'm in Brazil now, but I'm going to present at the International Studies Association a convention next year with a colleague from Vietnam. So we have been working on this on this paper, and uh, we we have been helping each other in different capacities. And uh, not only her, but many other students all over the world. We have this collab 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 collaborative and amazing network of fellows. Uh, unique field trips, as as Lulu told you, and uh, vibrant online and offline extracurricular life. You won't get bored. I can, I can assure that. Many research opportunities. And uh, for, I would say, like, not, last but not least, the lack of China-related research in my home country. You know, we don't have East Asian departments. We don't have Chinese language programs in, in, in universities. They're quite specific and limited. So uh, Yanqing was the best and the first opportunity I ever had to study China as an academic interest. So if you, if you feel that that's your, case, that's your case, that you are in a similar situation, don't be afraid and please apply. Uh, and also my eagerness to study history, sociology, and philosophy, in other words, to experience academic life outside law school. Law school is a very popular degree here in Brazil, so it's not an amazing thing, you know, like uh, everyone goes to law school here in Brazil. So I went to law school, spent six years studying, studying law, six years studying law, and the first thing I wanted after law school was to go back to the foundations and study a little bit of philosophy, sociology, and history. And there's no better place to do that than in China, you know, like Weber, Marx, <laughs> basically everyone that is important in sociology and history at some point studied China. So it's, it's very interesting to, to you know, uh, revisit the basics while advancing in my China studies and, uh, I've been learning so much at the Yanqing Academy. You can't believe how amazing this program is in order to you know, immerse you in this kind of scholarly debates you know, about the greater virgins and how, uh, what is China modernity. You know? This is a very amazing program. So if you are, are uh, willing to explore beyond your uh, current interests, this is your program too. So please uh, answer. And, and, and ask, yourself, ask yourself and answer the following questions. Why China? Why Yanqing? Why Learn Society? And why you? Like, why me, you know? So take a deep dive into your personal, intellectual, and professional background. And please explore previous scholars' profiles on YTA website and make your case for what you could add to, add to the next cohort of Yanqing scholars. You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to be Chinese. You don't have to be American. You can be Brazilian, you know, and you can try to explore the best of your experience in your country uh, to, to tell Yanqing that you are valuable to this program and uh, I'm sure they will be generous to you because they selected me, you know. I'm not that, I'm not as amazing as Lulu and many other scholars. So 
just be honest and tell them uh, why you why do we want to be in China right now and why China please don't do, do don't do two things these are very common mistakes uh, avoid writing a fact sheet you know like China is is the largest trading partner of my country China is huge you know or general assumptions like China is super ancient China is futuristic it's huge you know it's uh, a global power uh, avoid these general assumptions. They won't help you to, to tell your China story and why do you want to be in China. So go straight to the point and tell Yanqing why they want to be in China right now and why Yanqing is your program, is the best way to access this, this new world for you or to advance your China studies career. Yeah, so that's, that's all. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lucas. Uh, really appreciate your presentation. And um, yeah, humble, very, very humble. Maybe maybe some humble bragging in there, but um, you know, good job. We appreciate your <laughs> your your you know high high review, and we're looking forward to um, seeing what you do in the future. Um, okay, so um, most of the panelists or most of the attendees didn't notice this but i was unfortunately uh, my computer shut down and i got kicked off for about three minutes but i'm i'm back here and now it's time to go for um some of the questions so if you see me referring to my phone that's because i have screenshots of the questions as they came in please forgive me so i'm going to address these in the order that they came in and i'm also going to mention to um you know after i answer the questions i'll, I'll ask lucas um, and Angela, if there's anything you'd like to add to that. So um, there are quite a few questions um, about the application process and our sort of admissions priorities. So the first question we have that came in at 8.56 p.m. was, if selected for the interview, are we expected to show background knowledge of the specialization we choose? And similarly, we had a question that came in about a couple minutes later that said, do students of law and society this law and society concentration need to have completed an undergraduate law degree. So on the first question, um, I'll take these two together. Um, yes, you should have background knowledge of the specialization that you're choosing, but you do not have to have completed an undergraduate degree in that concentration. So if you're applying to the law and society research concentration, you are not required to have completed an undergraduate law degree. Why? Well, because law and society includes both, I mean, it's a very, these are all very, very broad research areas that we have here. So we, I mean, we are an interdisciplinary program. Law and society isn't strictly relate, you know, limited to legal studies. It also includes sociology. It also includes, you know, historical sociology. There's a lot of ways that you can, you know, within the framework of law and society, craft a specific course of study leading to an interdisciplinary research project that you're interested in that isn't easily defined as law or as society. Um, but back to the interview question where it says, are we expected to show background knowledge of the specialization we chose? Well, you are supposed to show background knowledge because this is a graduate program and it's a highly competitive one at that. And so even before the interview stage, you need to, in your application materials, show us that you have some level of preparation uh, to qualify you for entrance into an elite graduate program in the field that you're studying. China studies with a concentration on law and society, assuming that's what you're interested in applying for. Remember, we will be looking at your academic transcript, the courses that you took, at any papers you wrote, um, any intern internship or work experience you might have, and with an eye to assessing, can this applicant, if admitted, have a reasonable expectation of being successful conducting research in the field that he that they have chosen at the graduate level? So you do need you know some background knowledge. You do not need to have an undergraduate law degree to apply um, to the academy. Um, so that is what I have for that question. Another question which came in at 857, um, what would you say are the key qualities, skills that you look for in a strong Yanjing applicant? 
boy, I mean, that's, that's a big, you know, that's the big thing. Um, on our website, you'll see that there are some things that we're interested in. Um, you know, we're interested in, you know, a strong academic record. We're interested in um, commitment to community service, giving back to society. We're interested in leadership experience or leadership potential. We're interested in uh, commitment to interest in or previous training in China studies broadly defined. And then we're interested in these sort of, you know, unique things about your personality that, that maybe only you can offer to enrich our um, community of Yanjing scholars. So very, very broadly, I think those are the, the four or five big qualities that, that we're looking for. But again, we're not a one size fits all program and we're not looking for, there isn't a, you know, a single, you know, profile or kind of student that we're looking for. In a previous um, open information session that I did a couple of days ago, one of our scholars had a, a really, really uh, pithy and um, I think useful way of thinking about what you should be trying to present in your application materials. I, I believe she called it um, the three C's. Um, so commitment, your commitment to the program and to China's, you know, commitment to the program to graduate study and to, you know, utilizing what you've learned at Yanjing Academy in your future career. The second C is um, charisma. You know, we want to know what makes you you. We want to know, we want to see who you are and see your confidence and see it shine through in your application materials. And then finally, China. Why you're interested in studying China, what have you done to prepare yourself for graduate study in China, and why you want to study China in China. So those three C's, I think, uh, commitment, uh, charisma, and China, I think is also an interesting way of thinking about that. Um, there's more information about the sort of five, you know, um, the five sort of, um, strengths that we're looking for in applicants uh, on the website. Um, Luke, is there anything that you uh, would like to add to that about are the key qualities or skills we're looking for? I would just like to stress your point, Professor Haas, that you have to show yourself in the application, not showing yourself, you know, in a, in a negative way, but letting uh, the admissions office know why you are your why you you have your own you know personality i think that you, you know just uh trying to tell you again what i told you during my presentation you know don't uh, uh present a fact sheet about china or about yourself you know your cv is there for, is there for this purpose so you know doing your statement and uh and writing show your your interest and uh why you are intellectually curious about china you know it's uh, everyone knows that china is important it's huge it's ancient it's futuristic you can say all that but why you are interested in china you know there is a there is a particular reason uh maybe you are uh you 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 have been in china maybe you are from a developing country and you work and want to learn more about how china has developed but this is very particular to you so try not to put those general phrases, you know, in your application because Yanqing is very specific and rigorous about that. It's, it's not, you don't have to only show that you know how China and how and why China is important, but you know why do you want to be in China is a more specific question and why China matters. Thank you for that. Um, I, I I totally agree with what you said there, Lucas. Um, okay, uh, we have more and more questions coming into the Q&A function, so let's move on the ones that were uh, in the order that they came in. Um, okay, so uh, we have a couple of students asking about partner universities. So Yinjing Academy has partnerships with 71, now maybe 72 universities, leading universities around the world. If you, you can go to our website and see what, our part, what are the partner universities of Yanjing Academy. If you are a student at or an alumni from one of our partner universities, you must apply to the partner university first. 
in essence, because we know the partner university so well and they know us so well, the first round of admissions decisions will be made at the partner university itself. So if you think you might be from a partner university, please go to our website and confirm that. And there are uh, contact people at the university that know, and they have an, an generally an earlier on-campus application deadline. Um, what this means is that simply the, the first, you know, the um, partner universities review applications from their own students and alumni and then uh, make recommendations. They, they nominate a student to Yenjing Academy. Those students then enter the second round of Yenjing Academy's admissions process um, when then reviewed with all other applicants who, had, who applied directly to the Yenjing Academy. Um, and then those students who are reviewed and selected are offered an interview opportunity. Being a, mem being a student or an alumni from a partner university, essentially just we've outsourced the first round of admissions decisions to the partner university. It does not give any uh, distinct advantage um, in Yenjing Academy's second round admission decisions. So just want to clarify that there were a couple of questions on partner universities. One person said that um, their university was a partner university in 2017, but is not listed as one now. Um, I think that uh, for that student, I recommend that you email us at yca-admissions just so we can make sure. Um, but if, you're, if your university is no longer a partner university, then you apply to us directly by December 4th, 2020. Okay, um, we have a big question about, um, do we anticipate that international students will be able to get visas in time for the 2021 academic year with the current COVID-19 restrictions? Yeah, very, very big question, uh, and thank you for that. Um, yes, we do anticipate that uh, international students will be able to get visas in time for the 2021 academic year. Uh, we also are remain uh, optimistic that at least some of our 2020 Yanjing scholars and the second year 2019 Yanjing scholars will be able to return to Beijing at some point in um, the 2021 spring semester or 2021 summer. Um, we don't know that, obviously. That is way above uh, the decision-making power of the Yanjing Academy, of Peking University, really even of you know, the Beijing municipal government. That's at the you know, the, the top, top national level. Um, what I can say is that my, my, I anticipate that it will not be, um, or when China reopens for uh, international students, it will probably be on a step-by-step, region-by-region, or country-by-country -country basis. Um, I assume that they'll be keeping an eye on uh, the relative success of uh, combating COVID-19 spread and or the potential you know, widespread nature or widespread usage of the potentially any uh, vaccines that will be coming down the pipeline soon. So it's probably not going to be, the doors open for everyone anywhere in the world. It'll probably be um, students from certain regions or certain countries will be able to come in um, earlier than others. So yeah, that's the big question. Uh, we do uh, look forward to our current students arriving on campus or returning to campus, and we are moving ahead with the expectation that 2021 scholars will be able to be here on campus. We have, however, you know, gotten pretty good at online education. We currently have just under 30 Yanjing scholars on campus right now, scholars from mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, and one lucky Australian scholar who just happened to already be living in China. So he was in, on, you know, in country during the pandemic. So he was able to come to campus. So we will be offering on a combination of online and offline courses for the foreseeable future. And with the expectation that not every scholar will be able to come to campus at the same time. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we have another question that came in at 919. Uh, for academic performance, how does Yanjing compare GPA obtained in different universities? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we're aware that, you know, academic evaluation standards are not uniform worldwide. And since we uh, recruit globally, we're aware of the different standards in um, the vast majority of university systems around the world. Uh, we have a sort of 
conversion table, so to speak, between what a 4.0 or a 3.5 means in the United States and Canada versus what, um, you know, first class honors, uh, second class with distinction, et cetera, means in the UK and 4.0 scale, 5.0 scale uh, percentages, class rank, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we do, we are aware of the differences and we do take them into account in our academic review uh, as part of the admissions process. Okay, we have another question. Um, one uh, attendee asked, this program would be a master's of law, not a master's of Chinese Chinese studies. China studies is the term we use here. Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't go into too much detail about this. You know, even though we are an interdisciplinary program, you know, interdisciplinary research methods and interdisciplinary education is a fairly new um, field of study in the People's Republic of China. So we are a China, at a Chinese university. We work under the regulations of the Ministry of Education of the PRC. And I don't want to go into too much detail. If you're accepted, there will be a, a detailed orientation that describes this. But the degrees will be in master, will be in China studies. But the way that we have our degrees and our program of study accredited in the PRC's Ministry of Education is it will say, like, let's say law and society, it, your diploma will say Peking University, Master of Law, and then the sort of area of that will be China Studies, Law and Society, or Peking University, Master of History, China Studies, History and Archaeology or Peking University Master of Literature, China Studies, Literature and Culture, et cetera, et cetera. This is just how we've negotiated the process uh, of accreditation for an interdisciplinary China Studies program. Um, and the student asks a second question. Is it possible for references in the research proposal to be in the second page? Um, I think you best to send that send us an email about your specific questions. If you're saying if, if there's like a um, citations or references to, to books or articles by other scholars. Um, yes, then I think that would be fine to have a brief list uh, a bibliography kind of thing in your in your research proposal. Uh, but that's something that please feel free to shoot us an email about about that level of detail. Uh, we had a scholar earlier um, that would ask, is there an LGBT plus network at Peking University or Yanjing Academy? Um, to my knowledge, there is not a former LGBT plus network at PKU or at Yanjing Academy. There have been some student organizations in the past, but, you know, with students uh, leaving, you know, that, you know, we are welcoming of all uh, people here at the Yanjing Academy. If you can get in, you know, if you make it through the rigorous admissions process, that's the only thing that, that we're concerned about. And when you're here, you have a, a new community of scholars and friends and colleagues to interact with. Um, I think sometimes these kinds of activities or these kinds of clubs or these kinds of groups are sometimes left best left to students to organize themselves. So nothing that I'm aware of that's formal, but uh, we are a diverse community in, um, many different ways of that word diverse. Uh, Lucas, I, I assume you maybe, do you need to head out to your uh, TA ship now? Yes, I told I told the students that I'm, I'll be joining them in five minutes. So maybe it's wise for me to leave you now. Uh, is there anything you'd like to, to say before you leave? I would like to thank you uh, for, for this and, and uh, encourage all of you to apply for this program. You know, uh, and uh, all, I can also tell you that not only Yanqing, but Peking University is a very welcoming community in China. So, uh, you know, I, I've played soccer with uh, students and staff of Peking University. It was an amazing uh, experience. In general, people are very welcoming. They want to practice their English with you. They want to learn where you're from and they want, are willing to accept you as you are. So. Uh, I can assure you that it's a very welcoming community, and the office provides you all the all the you know support you will need. So 
you, you don't have to be afraid of applying. And also academic, academic freedom, it's, uh, it's an important thing for Peking University and for Yinchang Academy. So I have, I have had all the opportunities I needed and, and support I needed to do my research, to write, you know, and, uh, and I, uh, so you have to, you can feel confident about uh, how much Peking University and Yinchang Academy can support you on your future endeavors and your research projects while you are an uh, ancient scholar. So please apply and uh, thank you, Professor Haas. It's such a pleasure to see you again. Have a, have a great um, discussion section. Thank you. We're already out of time, but I'm happy to stick around for a, a bit longer. I think some of the questions are now coming up on my uh, Zoom phone. So we have a question that says, could you expand on the courses that Yanjing scholars can take? How much flexibility is there within law and society? Um, so, you know, I don't, there's not, I can't go into too much more detail on the courses right now, just off the top of my head. But what I can say, you know, you can look at the, at the video of the recording. We had a couple of slides up with courses in law and society, broadly defined at YCA and at Peking University, but that's only a small selection of the courses that are available in the broader PKU community, especially if you have an HSK level six, then there's lots and lots and lots more uh, that you can take on campus. But what I can say is there is an, a very, very large amount of flexibility within law and society. Um, again, this research concentration is important to your time here in those three ways that I mentioned. One, you apply to, you focus on one of the concentrations in your application. Two, um, it's how your thesis is reviewed by the um, faculty reviewers after your um, oral defense of your thesis when in preparation for graduating. They will choose faculty um, in fields related to your thesis topic. So they'll be drawing faculty from you know, what might be defined as law and society. And three, on your diploma, it will say China studies, law and society. Um, once you're here, in you know, consultation with your advisor, you can pick you know, any kind of um, elective course as long as it is interesting to you and as long as you and your advisor think it is preparation for the thesis topic that you want to actually research on. So a very, very high level of flexibility within this bro already broad area, research area of law and society. In your second year, your thesis advisor is, um, um, they will be essential to the success of your thesis, but they also will be there to guide you to a original research project that makes a contribution and um, meets the standards of Peking University and the disciplines um, notice the S on the disciplines in which it will be evaluated. Um, so how many courses does a Yanjing scholar take per semester? How long is each class? Is it possible to describe a day of the curriculum in YCA? Um, I don't think I can describe a, a day because uh, you have half of your courses are going to be electives and they're going to meet at different times. Um, but in any given week, you know, and since it's a graduate program, pretty much all or the vast majority of the master's graduate program or graduate courses at YCA and at, at Peking University meet once a week and they meet for three hours at a time. Um, and that is that was also the standard experience that I had doing my master's and PhD in East Asian history at the University of California, San Diego. So it's a long it's a long class with a single meeting per week. So that's something that you should expect. Um, the language courses, however, are different. You have, um, I want to say, you have four hours of language class a week. I think that's probably broken up into two two-hour classes. And then you have two hours of uh, individual language tutorial, one-on-one -on -one time with a language tutor, and you organize that according to both of your respective schedules. I'm going to try to um, push through some of these questions. I can give it another 15 minutes or so. Um, so let me just try to get through some of these uh, as quickly as I can. Um, 
Okay, so um, we have a question about the research proposal within the application process. Is it supposed to be a concrete proposal for a single research project and therefore appropriately laid out in detail as it may be the basis for the thesis or rather multiple research ideas, general areas we would like to look into during our studies? Very, very good question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think you can, you know, it's up to you how you want to do this. Um, we are not, we do not have um, hard and fast um, format or, um, you know, regulations for what shape your research proposal should take. Do remember it's only one page, so that does limit the amount of detail that you can go to in your research proposal. But we also like the challenge of a one pager. Um, it's, it's much more difficult to write effectively um, and convincingly and with erudition in one page than it is in 10 or 20 pages. So um, we think that's up to you. Um, if you have a, a really you know, strong idea about what you hope to research here, then go for it. You know, go for a more um, structured, targeted research proposal. But it's also, you know, it's also okay if you don't have that um, really, really solid understanding of what you think you want to study for your master's thesis. And so multiple research ideas, general areas would be, can be acceptable as well. Uh, I do think it's, it's helpful to mm, try to ground what you're talking about in your research proposal um, in some of the books or articles that other scholars have written. Um, that, in one hand, sh lets us know that you have already started thinking deeply about your potential research topic. Um, and it, show, it is a way for you to tell us or to demonstrate your um, you know, previous knowledge of something that you're trying to explore at the graduate level. Uh, someone else had a question down uh, below on a similar topic. Um, at, you know, if you have uh, Yenjing Academy faculty or Peking University faculty whose work has influenced you and you might be interested in um, you know, a, a teacher-student or advisor-advisee relationship with them, then we'd be happy to hear that as well. Again, we are not holding you to actually doing a master's thesis in what is um, indicated in your research proposal. And similarly, we're not going to, you're not committing to uh, trying to take courses with or uh, be an advisee of any Peking University professors that you might mention in your research proposal. Um, you know, it is, so there, there are multiple ways that you can try to approach it, but what we want to do is to force you in a um, short, paper to demonstrate to us what you're interested in exploring uh, research-wise and in so doing show us how you think and how you write about a potential research project. Um, Angela mentioned the acceptance rate um, to Yanjing Academy. What I can say is we generally get um, you know three, four, over 4,000 applications to the program every year for about 120 spots. Um, so that's, uh, that's about all I'm gonna say about, the, um, about our acceptance rates. Um, so just there you go about that. It is, it is, as I said before, a highly competitive program. Um, it might be helpful to mention a little bit about the admissions process. And this isn't directly related to any questions that came through, but um, deadline is December 4th. We then uh, have several weeks of very, very busy, intensive review of the applications that we've received. Um, we then uh, send out um, interview, in, interview requests for semi-finalists. Um, we have two rounds of interviews. Uh, they, some will be taking place in January. Some will be taking place in March. Why the big break? You know, well, that's because of Spring Festival, uh, so-called Chinese New Year, is a major holiday uh, in China and in Chinese universities. And so we will be doing one round of interviews in January. Uh, we will potentially be sending out offers to those in to so certain students in January. But if you don't receive an offer, um, or an interview request in January, there is still another round of interviews and offers coming in March. Uh, the final decision date for any offered students to accept 
um, the position at Yanjing Academy will be in early April. So just a little bit about our um, you know, application process, or, or pardon me, our admissions decision process. Someone asked about uh, whether we require a first class degree from the UK or is a 2.1 acceptable? Um, we do not have a set standard for what is acceptable in terms of GPA or first, second class honors without honors, et cetera. Um, obviously, we value academic excellence, um, but as I said earlier in the presentation, you know, academic excellence is required, but we also looked at the other, um, and we tried to take all in all aspects of our applicants, extracurricular activities, leadership experience, leadership potential, um, uh, sustained interest in China or commitment to China studies, career goals, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, a first class degree with honors is is obviously excellent, and that is um, great if you have it. But just because you perhaps have a a two point one, um, that should not preclude you from applying to the program. On the research areas, again, we have someone asking about: Would sociology be covered in law and society? literature, culture, or economics and management more? I mean, the easy answer to that is that, you know, sociology is, is generally considered under law and society. Um, you, know, le you know, legal studies and sociology are, are the two very, very broad uh, disciplines um, that we have thought about in law and society, but it's not, it's, not the, it's not just those two. For instance, if let's say you were interested in a, a research project or the problem of um, changing Chinese social relations from the 19th through the late 20th century, or say maybe under the Republic of China in the, from the 19 teens through uh, the end of the 1940s and the PRC period, let's say to the end of Maoism in the late 1970s. So let's say you wanted to look at the changing uh, family dynamics, look at a comparative study in the evolution of family dynamics in China from the 1920s through the 1970s. So cool, that sounds like an interesting project. But is that more of a sociology project? Is it more law and society? Or is it better included in history and archaeology? Is it more of a history project with, you know, that is using also some of the methodologies and lessons learned from sociology? Or is it a sociological research project that is also drawing upon some of the lessons from and methodologies in history? That's up to you. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of ways to think about um, how any individual interdisciplinary research project can be categorized. And I think in your application, you should think more about what are you stronger in now? What do you want to learn more about at the graduate level? You know, whether your project should be sociology plus history or history plus sociology. And so that's part of what we want to learn more about um, in your uh, research proposal part of the application. Um, a similar question, this, uh, this uh, attendee is mainly interested in anthropology. Would that follow under law and society? or perhaps under literature and culture. Um, again, I think that's the, you know, the same answer above. It, it depends on, you know, I, I can't answer that um, at such a superficial level. So I think it's more about what are you trained in? What are you more interested in learning? Are there some methodologies that perhaps you would pr want to use? Are there some, theories in anthropology or methodologies and sociology that you're that you're more interested in trying to integrate um, so th think about that question when you're writing your research proposal but also you should be strategic you know if you're interested in anthropological research um, i'm perhaps you have a degree or will have a degree in anthropology soon um, so then i think you should you know have you taken any sociology courses? You know, things like that. I think you should be strategic about which research area you're applying to while using your research proposal to give us more details about the potential project you're interested in. And um, yeah, I think that's so similar to the same, same answer to the question from above. Um, so I'm, um, we're down to three questions and I'm gonna cap it there. 
because my coffee is running off, running out and it's already late in the evening here in Beijing. So we have a um, we have a, a question about Chinese language. Uh, what is the level that scholars tend to achieve in Mandarin by the end of the program? Um, that is a that that's not an it's not possible for me to answer that question in general. It depends on what your language level is when you arrive. It depends on how you take advantage of your time here. Um, it depends also on um, you know your language learning capabilities. Um, also, I would like to give you some more detail on this. You know, it's if you you know if you arrive with intermediate Chinese spoken Chinese, um, and you work really really hard in your Chinese language courses, you take full advantage of your two hours per week of individual language tutor work. Um, you reach you make a, a, a an effort to reach out to and interact with Chinese students in Yanjing Academy and Chinese students at Peking University in Chinese, um, then that you can see a lot of improvement, um, a lot of improvement indeed. Also in the second year, um, we have the language enrichment scholarship for scholars in their second year who are no longer in courses but still want to continue their Chinese language study. Um, they apply to us um, for taking a language course, either a one-on-one -on -one course at Peking University, or sometimes we have scholars who go to other language programs, reputable language programs in Beijing, and we give them partial or full funding for continuing their Chinese language studies in the second year. Similarly, that option is also available for um, native Chinese speakers in their second year who are looking to continue their language study um, in other non-English foreign languages. Um, I used to run an intensive Chinese language program at Tsinghua University called IUP. And every year we would have three to four Yanjing scholars who were second year students who would come over and take courses with us at IUP as part of their language enrichment fellowship. Um, but I, I think it is, you know, learning Chinese, effectively communicating, reading and writing in Chinese is absolutely essential for anyone who wants to be a scholar of China. Okay, we have another one. Um, for the research proposal, would it be reviewed by a majority of Chinese or Western faculty? This is because the research proposal I'm writing on might have some differing views for different readers. Um, the majority of faculty members uh, who will be reviewing all applications are uh, Chinese faculty members. I will be reviewing all applications. Um, but we also have, um, you know, you know, this is a Chinese university. Uh, we have, there certainly are international faculty at, the, at this university. Uh, our director of graduate studies uh, is an American citizen of Chinese descent, um, born and grew up in China, did his graduate work abroad, PhD at, at Princeton University and taught there for many years and is now professor of history here and is um, the director of graduate studies for the Nanjing Academy. Um, what I think is important is that your research proposal will be reviewed by, critiqued, and discussed by Peking University faculty. So whether, regardless, you know, their national origin, I do not think is as important as is their scholarly and academic qualifications and their desire to um, accept talented, promising young scholars with, interesting, with sustained interest in China and interesting research, potential research projects. Um, and the last question. Um, so <laughs> I, I wish I had more time to answer all of your questions. Um, the last question is um, internship and employment programs of Yanjing master's graduates. Um, so Yanjing scholars in their second year are encouraged to and supported to find internship opportunities. Uh, most of our scholars find their own internships, but we're also here to assist. Uh, and to use our institutional connections and these organizations where past Yanjing scholars have interned to help you get your foot in the door. What does that mean? Tell you places where it's good for you to apply. Uh, we do not place you in internships. Um, similarly, um, a Peking University master's degree and being a Yanjing scholar has a lot of weight and it will open doors for you in the 
uh, application process for further graduate study or for uh, employment after you leave uh, Peking University. Um, however, we do not place you into positions, um, but I think being a Yanjing scholar and being a PKU uh, master's degree holder will help you uh, be a very, very competitive applicant in whatever internship or uh, job opportunity you're interested in exploring afterwards. Okay, thank you all so much. I'd like to let you know that we have two more open um, information sessions coming up next week, next Monday and next Wednesday at the same time. Uh, Monday will be on the Economics and Management Research Concentration at Yanjing Academy. Wednesday will be on three research areas, all in the broadly defined humanities, history and archeology, span literature and culture, and philosophy and religion. For some of you who ask questions about history and anthropology, might also be worth your while to tune in next Wednesday night at the same time for the history and archeology, span literature and culture, and uh, philosophy and religion. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we will be sharing this uh, video on our website. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please feel free to check out the website, probably tomorrow or the day after, to uh, view this video again. So um, this is Brent Haas, Director of Admission Affairs and Distinguished Associate Professor at Yanjing Academy at Peking University. Uh, in my office in Beijing at 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday. And with this, we're gonna sign off. Thank you all so much for joining us.